Shant, one of the most outstanding speakers that we have ever had, a good friend of Ima, and I think he really needs no further introduction. But having said that, I'm going to hand over the platform to uh, the Ima president, Mr. Sanjay Kiloska, to take over from here. Thank you very much, Amita, for accepting my invitation and joining us today. We are almost 300 here and close to 350 on YouTube already. So you have an audience of uh, which will probably cross 700 today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rekha. I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is the ninth uh, I'm a leader speak session. I'd like to congratulate uh, Rekha, our Director General, and her team for stepping up with so many extremely relevant programs uh, for our members. Thank you very much, Rekha. Uh, as usual, uh, our participants are on video but have been muted, and questions will only be through the chat mode. Uh, but as is well known, every ha rule has its excep exceptions, especially when we have a guest as eminent as today's. And uh, we have so many of IMA's past presidents and officers on this call as well. So let us begin. Uh, Amitabh uh, Kant, uh, CEO of Niti Aayog, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you with us and a very warm welcome to all for this special session. Amitabh, uh, many thanks from me for agreeing to speak with us about the policy blueprint for a post-COVID India. You have been an outstanding policy designer and an implementer for decades now. And as the CEO of Niti Aayog, you are an important contributor to the policy thinking of the government. You have come up with a six-point plan for the road ahead, which should help our government reopen the economy sooner than later. It is a privilege to have you with us to discuss the policy responses to the COVID crisis and its impact on India's economy. <clears throat> Just to set the context for this session, I would point out that there is an extreme pessimism about India's economic growth this year, and the expectations of a bounce back next year are mixed at best. India's GDP growth had slowed down to about 5% before the virus struck. And since then, the estimates of GDP growth have become progressively negative. After our government announced the nationwide lockdown in March, most global financial institutions and rating agencies pegged India's growth for 2020 at about two to 3%. After the extension of the lockdown in April, the GDP forecasts have been dragged down to under 1%. Some are even more pessimistic. Moody's has put it at nearly zero, that is 0.2%. And on the other hand, Nomura has forecast that our economy would shrink by about half percent. The forecasts for 2021 were quite optimistic in early March, but these two have been tempered April onwards. Still, the consensus was that we were among the few large economies that would see any growth at all during 2020 and rebound in 2021. However, that is no consolation. We just cannot afford low or negative, negative economic growth. It may be that the prophecies of doom are exaggerated and misplaced. Nevertheless, we need a plan to limit the damage to our economy and achieve a robust and rapid recovery. Our government's policies and programs would be central to reviving the economy. All of us are looking towards our government to provide relief and to enable recovery of our businesses and livelihoods. With these words, it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Kant, CEO of Niti Aayog, to tell us about how the government would stabilize the economy and what kind of policy blueprint it would need to accelerate India's economic growth in the post-COVID world. Over to you, Amitabh. Uh, so how the economy pans out uh, in the coming months would be a function of how the virus behaves in India. And it's very important to understand that seven states uh, where the virus is still playing havoc are actually the heart and soul of the commercial centers of India. And therefore, it's important to look at it from this perspective of both lives and livelihood. And I'll take you through a couple of slides on how in India is confronted uh, the battle of lives and how India should confront the battles of livelihood. And then uh, I'll open myself to some question answers from your end and I'll respond to some of them. 
so here are a few slides which will give you a perspective of how India has uh, faced this uh, challenge. Uh, so if Just give me a minute, some technical hitch, but let me share this with you. Screen it Yeah, we can see. We can see on the screen. Just a second. Just a second. Just give me a minute. So, uh, if you want to look at the chronology of this, uh, within a time span of 10 days, uh, uh, actually, all these countries, USA, France, Germany, UK, India, and Italy had uh, the coronavirus cases. Uh, uh, and actually, Italy is, uh, re reported the first case a day after India. Uh, yet, India's trajectory has been very vastly different. One of the reasons, because, uh, you know, this virus grows by geometrical progression and there is an exponential growth rate. And therefore, it was important to take some firm measures of locking down because, uh, uh, you know, if you were to flatten the curve, you get enough time for being able to ensure PPEs, ventilators, uh, COVID hospitals, etc. And that is what actually India has done uh, so that you get adequate time for all the states to prepare. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the share in global fatalities, actually, and uh, you look at this slide, uh, India's, uh, as of 4th May, India's fatalities were just around 1,400, whereas USA was around 68,602. And India's share is just about 0.6% of the global COVID-19 deaths. Now, uh, uh, despite reporting the first positive case a day after India, Italy has uh, witnessed a very high number, and you'll see this very sharp curve of Italy. But India's, in India's case, uh, since uh, you know, in week four itself, Italy had experienced a 216% growth, whereas in our case, the rate has been rather uh, relatively constant. I'm showing this because it will give you a perspective of how uh, uh, it will give you a perspective of how we've performed. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, in week 12, since the first recorded cases of each country, cases in USA were 39 times higher than India. Cases in France were about seven times higher. And cases in Italy were about 11 times higher than India. And actually, India's five-day moving average of total positive cases is the lowest in comparison to all these countries. Uh, we uh, reported, India reported it's actually its first death on 13th March. Uh, the total deaths in Italy by that time were already about 1,000. Uh, we reported about 166 deaths in week 10, while USA's uh, reported deaths were about 19 times more. So even if by five-day moving average, the fatalities are the lowest in comparison to other countries. Now, uh, I wanted to just show you that growth in India of both daily and cumulative cases uh, can, have been consistently linear. They've been lower and they've been non-exponential. And uh, actually, uh, on day 65, after the first case, US daily volume was about 25 times India's volume. Uh, now, uh, actually, uh, this is an Oxford University study which has shown that India's lockdown measures have been amongst the most stringent in the world. Now, uh, this was necessary because India is a very vast country of 1.3 billion and if we had allowed community infection to spread, it would have been very difficult. It's also important to say that many countries which tried to save their economy have neither been able to save lives nor their economy. 
and actually both have got impacted so strategically it was very important to keep uh, uh, you know a, a very very strong hold on uh, lives and stop community infection from spreading and we took some very bold and timely decision in terms of air travel in terms of inter district travel in terms of janta curfew in terms of a lockdown and uh, we contained the spread of the virus and actually uh, you know i quite admit to the fact that india's uh, has had amongst the stringent measures amongst all the countries uh, and actually in the long run this will pay us off as we go along and even stringently uh, you know just look at usa where uh, they have not they initially did not do a lockdown and states after states did their lockdown and actually uh, you look at this uh, uh, the growth of cases in india has been very very low as compared to uh, usa both in terms of fatalities and in terms of overall cases now if we the lockdown effect of this uh, we tried to look at this and by on 25th april uh, we examine this and if our Uh, we hadn't done a lockdown then our total cases which which are uh, would have been more than about 10 lakhs and the fatalities would have been about almost 15 times more in the absence of a lockdown so even now we don't see an exponential trend and one of the criticisms of india has been that we've had a very uh, low rate of uh, testing uh, but we've increased the total number of testing from about uh 1400 now to close to about uh you know we are doing about 75000 and we'll soon reach about a lakh of tests per day but our positives actually which were about, about 4.6% has actually come down to 3.4 for from 4.7% to 3.4% so the we we are largely doing very very uh, uh hot spot and symptomatic cases and therefore a percentage of positive should have been much much higher but remained at about 4.7 between 4.7 and 3.4% it's at 3.4% now france is at about 23% spain is at about 16% and uh us is at about 17% so overall the spread of infection our view is that even if you do more testing much more testing even if you reach about a lakh you will find that the number of positives will still be low we are right now doing about 75000 tests per day uh, positive detection rate rates are are actually have fallen rather than going up and uh, you know i am uh, just showing you this mortality rate that uh, uh, our mortality rate is the lowest in the world it's at about 3% as compared to 15% in uk it's about uh you know 14% in italy france is about 15% but our mortality rates are the lowest i also want to show you this because it's important to understand this because many people are very enthusiastic about economy and i so am i i'm a great believer that we need to get our economy cracking and we need to get everything going uh so i wanted to show you this position of states where uh the percentage of their share is more than 1% and uh, there are 17 states which have less than 1% uh some states have 2 to 4% 4 to 5% but there are five there are seven states which have more than 5% uttar pradesh rajasthan maharashtra tamil nadu delhi madhya pradesh gujarat so if you look at it this is really the heart of india in terms of economic activity that's maharashtra gujarat uh, mumbai there uh, rajasthan tamil nadu madhya pradesh uttar pradesh more than 5% and actually the situation in mumbai and delhi to my mind is uh, is not so good right now even so we need a very concentrated attack there so these are seven states which need a very focused attention uh, i am showing you this because actually if you look at kerala kerala was able to flatten the rate but if you look at weekly cases uh, while telangana has shown noticeable improvement uh and rajasthan and tamil nadu are doing relatively well but delhi gujarat maharashtra mp require very rigorous monitoring and containment and there's a challenge there uh so if you look at kerala that's flattened the curve totally uh totally flattened the curve 
Uh, now, Telangana is also flattening. Uh, some states, uh, there has been a one week fall, but you need to make it fall for about five to six weeks in a row, one after another. And this requires a very, very concentrated practice of isolation, contact testing, and uh, uh, isolation and treatment. And uh, therefore, we are waiting to see this breakthrough happening in other states as well. There are uh, some districts uh, which have very high uh, level of high load districts, districts which contribute to more than 1%. And I just wanted to show you that actually uh, Mumbai, Delhi, Ahmedabad, Indore, uh, I'm treating Delhi as one district here, uh, but Mumbai, Delhi, which are really the heart of commercial activity, uh, the situation is not good at all. And uh, Ahmedabad, Indore, Jaipur, Pune uh, are the other places where I've given you their contribution to national cases and the contribution to state cases. So uh, Marash, Mumbai is contributing to about almost 40% of Mumbai's cases and Ahmedabad is contributing to about almost 69%. So this is, uh, these six districts and five states need very, very aggressive containment and monitoring strategies. And uh, Hyderabad shows a declining trend here. Uh, but if you look at cases per million, uh, you will again see that I'm just taking you through some of this because to understand that uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Delhi are still showing very high cases per million and high load states show greater than national average in positive cases detected as a percentage of the total tests being conducted. And therefore, we need a very, uh, very, very strong uh, uh, this thing, but in some some states like Madhya Pradesh also need to ramp up their testing. And uh, Maharaj, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, and Delhi have actually been uh, doubling their rates uh, at much, much uh, lower than the national average. So they are doubling really rapidly. Uh, now, the southern states have shown a very high recovery rate, as you will see here. I'm just jumping through these slides because I want to come down to the main issues of the presentation. And, uh, you know, the challenge really would be about uh, uh, trying to find a vaccine. This is quite a quite some time away. This will take you more than uh, more than a year, at least. Uh, you know, Oxford University is doing work. There's a uh, company called Moderna, which is doing work. Uh, Gilead uh, is doing is doing fairly advanced work on this. And there are six Indian companies. Uh, which are working, and I have uh, Zydus Cadela, Bharat Biotech, Indian Immunologicals, Minvax, Serum uh, Institute, and Biological E. I'm mentioning their name, and there are two more which have today claimed that they are also working. I'm mentioning their name uh, because it's very important that India is able to find a vaccine from one of the Indian companies because that will enable us to provide. Uh, vaccines at low price points, at very low price points to Indians, and that's critical. Because right now, the only vaccine you have is uh, physical distancing. That's the only uh, vaccine you have. And without a vaccine, full-fledged economic activity, much as Mr. Sanjay Kirloska would wish, would be very, very difficult. I can assure you that. Uh, and therefore, uh, my view is, on, is that instead of looking at districts, we need to hyper-localize, we need to aggressively contain and test in red zones, uh, make very, very, which, which provide for high case load states, uh, very closely monitor orange zones and open up green zones. Uh, we need to do more testing in some states. Uh, we need to continue with new norms. We need to continue to save lives of people with comorbidity who are 60 plus and uh, save livelihoods. Uh, it, now, my belief is that we've done relatively well, except in two or three major states. Uh, we've been able to save lives in a very big way because our percentage is still very low. And therefore, there's, it opens up the possibility of uh, opening up your economy. And we need to now that the government has, while it calls it lockdown three, in my view, it's opening up uh, 1.0 and it's opened up, it'll take you another three or four more days to see how things pan out in the States because there's an element of fear and we need to get this element of fear out much as there was an element of fear after the 1928 Great Depression. 
And this fear is there in the minds of all uh, civil servants. It's in the mind of uh, businessmen. It's in the mind of politicians. We need to get this out to be able to get economic activity back again. On the economic activity, I would merely like to say that it will be very difficult to get full economic activity back unless and until states do not open up the entire supply chain. It's not possible to open up a manufacturing unit till we don't open up the shops as well and allow supply chains to work. Now, <clears throat> this would require a lot of discipline. This would require a lot of physical distancing. This would require a lot of distancing, uh, uh, discipline amongst Indians. We yesterday saw how Indians behaved when the liquor shops were opened. And if we do not do this, then you will have a very, very poor situation of infection spreading in other areas. And therefore, Indians need to be here. Now, I personally have the view that as we move forward, uh, COVID-19 actually pandemic will provide an opportunity. Uh, you know, the status quo will change. The supply lines will change. The supply chain will break. And China, which for many years, uh, many decades has been the key supplier to the world, uh, its, state, its position will greatly get altered. And therefore, we need to challenge the assumptions of business as usual. And India needs to take advantages of new opportunities. And my view is that uh, sooner or later, the government will, and the government is working on a package, and I don't want to preempt this because this is the prerogative of the finance minister. Uh, the government will come out with a package. And this package should be accompanied by very serious structural reforms in the economy across sectors, across agriculture, across uh, you know, public distribution, across manufacturing, across a whole range of areas. But the key there is that uh, India is a global manufacturing and exports. We have to convert India as a global manufacturing and export hub. Uh, I think digital payments uh, fin we should drive our financial inclusion. Uh, healthcare must become truly digital. This will be the age of cloud hospitals, tele and video cons consultation. And actually, through Aroke Setu, uh, we've demonstrated, we worked in private public partnership. We were able to create technologically a world class app within 10 days' time. And now, uh, again, then we work with some private sector companies and we created telemedicine, uh, a, a new app, uh, Arogya Setu Mitra, uh, which is a part of Arogya Setu now, and it drives uh, telemedicine. That was also driven within a period of just seven, eight days. And it's, all of this is world-class technology. And therefore, uh, we will, India will have to use technology to leapfrog. And there, I think, Artificial intelligence will have to take center stage. Uh, my view is that there will be several sectors which will see a whole new emerging areas of growth and disruption will be inevitable. And in these sectors, India must seize the opportunity to become a key player. And this would require actually size, scale, and speed of action. And I just wanted to tell you that my view is that uh, the world of mobility will be in the midst of its biggest disruption. Uh, within this decade, we would transit from combustion vehicles, which have 2,000 parts, to a very shared, connected, and electric world. And electric vehicles will have just 20 parts, as you are all aware. There's a huge opportunity for India because USA already has over 900 cars per 1,000 persons, and Europe has over 800 cars per 1,000 persons. In contrast, in India, per capita ownership of vehicles is just 20 vehicles per 1,000 people. And therefore, India has a very, very unique opportunity to leapfrog ahead from the legacy model of individually owned combustion vehicles. Uh, I also feel that the cost of battery is falling very rapidly. It has fallen down from lithium ion battery prices have fallen from about $1,100 per kilowatt hour to about $175 per kilowatt hour. They'll fall further. Uh, the government has supported this movement by a lower GST tax structure, 5% as compared to 28%, 5% for electric vehicle as compared to 28% for combustion vehicles. We've given tax deduction and interest for loans and supported procurement through the FAME2 scheme. And therefore, uh, you know, in India, we have about 78% two-wheeler vehicles. 
but we've recently seen established players like Bajaj and TBS launching their electric vehicles. Uh, we've also seen the emergence of very innovative startups in EV ecosystem, Atha, Okinawa, Revolt, Talk. Uh, and therefore, uh, actually in two wheelers, we'll reach price parity with conventional combustion engine vehicles, uh, even on the initial cost of ownership in the next two to three years. So there will be a huge disruption and this is a massive opportunity for India to become the lowest global manufacturer of electric two wheelers and three wheelers. I think the second area which presents an enormous economic opportunity for India is the domestic manufacturing of lithium ion batteries because uh, this is an electric vehicle's most expensive component and uh, you know, storage batteries are critical not only for electric vehicles, but for the spread of solar rooftops and renewable energy. Uh, the recent tenders which we've had for, uh, you know, solar plus energy tender storage, the average tariff has come to about 4 rupees, 4.4 and 4.30 per kilowatt hour. And these are the cheapest renewable plus energy bids in the world. And they, according to me, they demonstrate that the days of coal and fossil fuel power are over and therefore you will there'll be a huge opportunity and actually even if we were to import lithium and nickel uh, india can do about 80% capture it can capture about 80% of the economic opportunity uh, by establishing manufacturing capability and supply chains for battery cells and packs in india and therefore uh, right now this is a huge opportunity for india to become a global uh, center for battery manufacturing uh, the third area I want to point out is uh, the rapid transformation that will take place through artificial intelligence. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a report by Accenture which Revive for Growth, which forecasts that AI has the potential to boost India's growth by 1.3% by 2035. And, you know, this is about 957 billion or 15% of the gross uh, GBA uh, gross value added by 2035 and India you know has the potential because we have built up Aadhaar, we have built up unified payment interface, GST and Aishman Bharat, all this have, are of large size and scale and therefore they provide a massive opportunity and therefore uh, that's an area where we need to reorient our academic institutions, our IITs, triple IITs as centers of excellence producing data scientists and artificial intelligence managers of tomorrow. Now, the fourth uh, key area of transformation is, the, is to my mind where India needs to uh, make a quantum jump is the fifth generation mobile technology network. And this will actually, 5G will interconnect, uh, you know, it will radically transform the world of communication, mobile technologies and flow of data. Uh, we were late in exploring 2G, 3G, and 4G technologies, but 5G will be another world. Uh, the user experience data rate will see a 10x jump. The spectrum efficiency will be 3x higher. The latency in milliseconds will be 10 times better. It will connect 10 lakh devices per kilometer squares compared to a mere 1 lakh in 4G, and it will drive Internet of Things. Uh, and therefore, uh, these four areas and I think the fifth area is genomics because uh, genomics will uh, will be a key to our understanding the structure of the genome including the mapping genes and sequencing of DNA and uh, last year the government launched the ND gen project which will which which gives the full genomes of over uh, thousand individuals are sequenced and the data handed over so there's a good case for the India Gen project to be upgraded into a national genome mission. And uh, therefore, I personally feel that these are five or five areas, according to me, which are critical for India's growth story as uh, disruption takes place around the world. Uh, I think we've already done some work around some new champion areas. We've uh, moved, uh, we've, uh, the government has announced a new scheme from mobile and electronic manufacturing where all value addition will be done in India, uh, it looks at, uh, you know, providing an incremental support for manufacturing beyond certain levels. Uh, we've come out with a new scheme for uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients and for medic, pharmaceutical sectors. 
and we are working on new schemes for food processing auto components we are working on a new scheme for textiles which will support uh, where we support in creation of some global champions for india so as i said mobile manufacturing medical devices pharmaceutical textiles we've done now we are working on auto and automobile and auto components networking products food processing uh, battery storage and solar pv manufacturing uh, our view is that uh, you know actually we built the backbone of digital payments uh, and actually uh, if you look at all these uh, uh, areas of uh, you know every second bank account which was built during create which was opened during 2014 and 2018 every second bank account was in india so we have created the back end and i think now we need to build the new structure on the basis of which we are able to do all transactions all credit all do paperless contract and build uh, you know world class products which are being built on india stack with open api and i think uh, digi lockers push for upi push for payment apps push for credit push for transaction uh, push ensure that everybody gets a salary into his account through direct benefit transfer and therefore there's a huge opportunity uh, through uh, uh, payments e sign digital lockers uh, you know um, all these areas are massive massive opportunities for india to make india a more efficient economy in the days to come i think the other two areas which are very critical are healthcare and social and education both in the digital world uh, we are building up 150000 health and wellness centers we are opening up more medical colleges but this gives you a massive opportunity to create more doctors but provide healthcare at the right price point similarly opening up digital education in a much bigger way through our colleges and universities will be a critical challenge ensuring that we get huge investments in education and health from our private sector this cannot be the job only of government you need private sector and to my mind these are two sectors which with reforms will open up in a very big way uh, i also feel that uh, we've come out with new telemedicine guidelines uh these are new areas of growth completely new areas of growth of moving away from face to face consultation to online consultations and e pharmacies this will be completely new areas of growth and uh i think uh, what we've demonstrated is that working with private sector we could create arogya setu uh, we've had over 90 million downloads till today uh, we have a massive opportunity as i said up on artificial intelligence and i think a huge amount of work needs to be done on data infrastructure computing adoption research and development in the days uh, to come with the private sector uh, my belief is uh, my belief always has been that uh, india has the possibility of becoming a leading nation uh, only if we are able to work with the private sector in sunrise areas of growth uh, i uh, am of the belief that while we be able to save lives it's important to save livelihoods the world of economy the world of business will go through a massive massive disruption in the days to come and only those countries will emerge as winners uh, which are able to handle new areas of uh, growth uh, this happened with japan post world war 2 this happened with south korea and this has happened in recent times with china they have got into new areas of growth and that is what india needs to do uh, i uh, i am deliberately not touching on how low our growth will go definitely we will have lower growth i have no doubt in my mind but i think the important thing is that once we are able to handle this issue of uh, uh, the virus spreading from our main commercial cities we should bounce back and bounce back with three shifts and get into completely the challenge is not to do the same things the challenge is to do in things intelligently and the challenge is to do things smartly and get into new areas of growth and that is what i've tried to point out in this presentation today uh, i'll be very willing and happy to respond to any query that you may have thank you uh, thank you amitabh uh, for me actually the most important and joyful takeaway was the rise in number of tests that are being done daily 
Uh, my daughter actually majored in biology and mathematics and uh, worked at MIT to develop a vaccine for dengue. So I know that a vaccine is uh, quite some time away. So let's get right into uh, start, start getting into questions and I'll ask the first question. Uh, while there will be many questions on the economy, let me start with design and manufacturing or preparing for the future. And you spoke about so many opportunities for the future. We've seen that during this pandemic, most countries have cut themselves from each other. You as DIPP head were earlier in charge of Make in India. So my question is, what changes could we make in our procurement policies to encourage design in India, as in develop and protect IP in India, to promote domestic technology and those of our industries which are heavily dependent on imports, if possible, if you could be more specific. And I'm talking about, you know, procurement policies to encourage design in India. So uh, one is we've done an analysis of all things that we import and wh what we need to do to manufacture in India. And I'll be very happy to share that with you, Sanjay. Because the challenge is that how do we, we've demonstrated in just about two weeks time that we could create uh, about 45 textile manufacturers who could do manufacturing of uh, personal protection equipment and actually now we'll be in a position to actually export personal protection equipment from India. All that capacity was built up in just two weeks time. We could demonstrate that we had young startups like Agua and Scandray. Uh, and the great thing was that large companies like Maruti partnered Agua to do large scale manufacturing of ventilators. We could demonstrate that actually companies like Mahindra's and Tata's could do a vast number of things on ventilation, etc. And, uh, you know, so a huge amount of work, innovative work. I mean, look at N, uh, surgical and N95 masks, all now being made in India. And actually, India has become the center for large scale manufacturing of all this, all within two weeks. There is no rationale at all as to why we should be an importer of a vast number of items from China. Uh, we have a Make in India uh, public uh, uh, regulation and under which we will ensure that uh, all tenders, in fact, one of the tenders recently, which was being issued for China, uh, you know, for some of the large companies from abroad, we stopped it to ensure that Indian companies bid for it. Uh, but, you know, the Indian companies also must be able to manufacture to size and scale, must be able to get into new areas. It's important to understand this, that you can't build an inefficient India. You have to be globally competitive. I mean, you can't work on protectionism all the time. Your Indian companies must be world class, should be able to take Chinese companies head on uh, with new technology. If, if there is no Chinese company, if there is no Indian company for 5G, what does India do? And therefore, it's very important that Indian companies also work to size and scale and are able to, we are willing to support Indian companies head on. We are willing to handle them. We are willing to ensure that all tenders are skewed in their favor. That we will ensure. Uh, but Indian companies must also ensure that they produce to scale, they produce to size, they produce to uh, global standards and make India a center for top class manufacturing, exactly what Japanese companies have done over the years. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will go to the uh, next question with uh, Sunil Munjal. Sunil, are you on? Sunil is our past president. Mr. Kidlossi, yes. he'll just, he's, he's there, but I need to unmute yeah. him. You can go to the now, next can you, one. Please. Can you okay. hear me now? Oh, yep. There he is. Okay. Yeah. So, Amitabh, thank you for an outstanding address. As always, this was uh, very comprehensive, very clear, and I have to say somewhat bold in some of the areas. I had five different questions in my mind, and you answered all five of them as you were addressing us. So I'm going to ask you a slightly different question now. Uh, you alluded to India's potential for high growth for manufacturing and other economic activities. And the whole world recognizes now that many major companies who are in China or depending on China are looking at an alternate. Do you think it's possible for us to create a crack team to go and specifically pitch to individual companies, and I'm talking over a thousand companies, to show them why it is beneficial for them to come to India, not why we are interested, but why they should be interested. And obviously for, for us to be able to, to attract them here, 
we need to address some of our base factors like land acquisition is very complex labor laws are very stiff so we have three or four known challenges right now do you think we have the ability to do both of these things right now use use the crisis to address big reforms yeah so sunil that's a very important point and actually some of this the government is working on right now but it's is it, that's really the key uh, we've identified about uh, 1450 companies to a matrix across the world uh, where we are getting in touch with them uh, on a regular on a daily basis to see so the important two important things on this one is that you you can get in touch with any company across the world but you have to make india efficient you know if your port turnaround time is going to take you more than three times that of china or if your custom regulations are going to hold you on so one of the exercises which we are doing is how do you make uh, the import and export of goods efficient how do you make your ports efficient how do you ensure that uh, companies come in and get, do a plug and play facility in some of the new centers that we have built up like dholera aurangabad or ek city and uh, you know down south in several of these new centers where we just create a plug and play facilities for companies to come in and uh, get in and that is what our aim is and secondly uh, uh, create two or three initial autonomous uh, employment zones where people come in put their manufacturing and are able to quickly turn around and export from there that's the main intention and therefore in these areas at least we should not have the regular labor laws or regular land laws Uh, we should be uh, totally open to getting away from the existing uh, land and labor laws so that uh, people are able to move quickly invest and move forward thank you uh, let me go to the next uh, you know just to on that point of sunil so yeah. that's how we identified these uh, three or four areas we identified mobile manufacturing api Uh, uh you know pharmaceuticals and now we have identified four or five sectors on which more work is going on we will provide some kind of a, we are, we'll provide some kind of an incentive on investments uh, beyond the existing base level for companies to move in sanjay can i ask one more is there time i hope amitabh has the time uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are like about sixty uh, questions. I don't think I'll. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Let, let, let somebody else ask. That's okay. fine. Let somebody else ask. Okay, uh, Rajiv, uh, Rajiv, call. Uh, do you have? Yeah. I uh, believe you have a question. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sanjay, and uh, Amitabh, as always, uh, very motivational and indeed inspirational. So thank you very much. I would like to uh, touch on uh, your theme about uh, leapfrogging. Uh, over other countries using uh, technology and i think uh, what you said that every threat or in this case uh, pandemic has given india a great opportunity i i totally subscribe to it and i was wanting uh, to find out from you as to how we can do this uh, using startups you know india is doing very well on the startup front it's creating a lot of new jobs it's bringing in new technology it's bringing in innovation and indeed it's bringing in very importantly global savings into our country and that's really required because indian savings be they household or corporate all will be very uh, very very low so to get the capital investment cycle going i think it'll be ideal to leverage global savings coming in to create jobs to leap from technologies to the startup uh, ecosystem so i'd like your comments on this no i think it's a very important point uh, that our startups have done very well we've been able to create uh, the second best ecosystem in the world uh, you know uh, and uh, i i think we need to give it a a big push and actually one of the things that we are looking at on the direction of the prime minister we formed just yesterday seven groups seven groups which will look at use of technology uh, to drive the new india and uh, this group has started work today so across several areas cross cutting areas we are working with these groups and most of it is being driven by the startups uh, on digital payment on uh, you know of 
farm to fork. Uh, many of these areas we've identified, seven areas we've identified, we've put a team of startups and some senior people who'll come out with a plan to how to use technology. And actually it's PM, what PM wants is that in some of these things, we are able to actually implement the pilot quickly and move on. Uh, so we are working on that right now, but I, I really feel that uh, that's an area, startups is an area They've done some cutting edge work around health. They've done some cutting edge work around education. I mean, if you look at some of the work done by uh, some of our startups is really astounding, you know, uh, using artificial intelligence. There's a young girl called Aditi who runs a startup called Imbibe and she uses artificial intelligence to improve education. You know, so she tracks every student every student on how they perform on education, on, on maths, history, you know, physics, and then gives extra dosage of education. And therefore, Rajasthan did very well because of the use of AI in education. Or look at Baiju, or, you know, several of them have done very well. So we are uh, looking at how we can replicate this model in many other areas. But I really feel what you've said is very critical that startups will be one of the key areas to do innovation and drive India's growth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Preeta, Reddy, uh, you're next with your question. Thank you, Amitabhji. You know, you actually answered uh, most of our questions. And just to reinforce some of the thoughts, first, I think the government's doing an outstanding job. We're lucky to be in India than anywhere else. But having said that, if now is the time for Make in India, what are the things we should actually do differently? You know, what are the one, two, three things we should do differently uh, to see that it's a huge success? And the second thing is skill in India has become so important because uh, we are the largest English speaking workforce and we really can do not only in healthcare, but in many other aspects. So what can we expect in terms of policy for both skill, skill in India and what can we do as, uh, you know, as public, as people in business to see that Make in India is really successful this time? So two things. First is, uh, you know, uh, for years, India has been taxing manufacturing in India at the cost of agriculture. You know, you have higher rates on electricity, you have higher rates of land. Everyone who does manufacturing pays an enormously higher component to the state. You subsidize agriculture, but you penalize manufacturing. Uh, and therefore, it's very important for states to realize that actually manufacturing is going to grow their economy and it's not possible. And therefore, in future, whatever we do from the government, must be done through a challenge route with the states so that states are able to fix their electricity, their land rates for the next 20, 25 years and there is no escalation. Otherwise, it's, you know, manufacturing is always penalized. That's number one. So we must understand this because Make in India will not succeed as long as the political mindset is that we are going to penalize and charge extra from manufacturing. As if manufacturers, as if Make in India is a crime. You know, it is not. And that is the only way India will grow forward. Thank this you. Is Number two is that Indian companies uh, must, uh, you know, whatever it happens, must either uh, beg, borrow or steal technology from abroad. It's, you know, you can't, India can't be a second class manufacturer. What has China done in every area of uh, every look at look at their uh, technology of transportation. Look at their maglev. Look at their road transportation. Every area they they borrowed technology, they stole technology, they purchased technology, but they made China a world class technological power, and that is why they were able to produce at low cost. And that is why I'm stressing this. It's not possible to keep. You know, it can't be that we keep working with shoddy technology. Our technology will, must be the world's best. And it's possible to do this because we've demonstrated this in automobile sector. There's no reason why we shouldn't replicate that story across other sectors. And that to my mind is, is critical. And the third point is that Indian companies and Indian uh, public sector and Indian labs 
uh, including CSR labs, are extremely guilty of not registering patents in India. Our patent record is extremely poor and pathetic, to say the least. And therefore, there's a huge onus on all of us to become far more innovative and do patent registration in India. You do these two or three things. And the fourth, of course, in the initial bit, I think in the next two to three years, next three years, every single tender of government must be given out only to Indian companies. And you will see the whole mood changing in India. Fantastic. Your answer to Preeta's question was music to my ears. I've been <laughs> dying to hear something like this. Our uh, next questioner is our Senior Vice President, Mr. Harshpati Singhania. Hi, Amitabh. Uh, again, I'll be true. This was a lot of saying is music to many of us. And I'm glad uh, that you're handling some of these things head on about deep reforms, about really having, uh, Sunil asked about the factor input costs. I want to come back a little bit down to our immediate issues which is to say, and you touched on it very eloquently, but I just want to highlight that. I think uh, the first thing we need to do is to restore confidence back in the system. While, you know, the government has opened up a lot of things and will continue to open up, people today are apprehensive. So when we see the issue of migrant labor, for example, and this is one example, uh, they are moving because they are fearful. So my thought and question is, what can we do together? And it's not about migrant labor. It's about even families. When we want to go to work, some of our family members will hold us back. So the issue is, how do we together as government, as business, as society, how can we communicate that it is okay? Because the fact of the matter is, tomorrow when we go to office, it's not that the coronavirus has gone away. It is still there. In fact, we were in the safest times being confined. So how do we build the confidence to say that, you know, we have to get back to work? Because that is the key to everything, the way I'm seeing this unfold. Uh, your comments, Amitabh, thanks. So two things. One is, uh, it's very important to understand that virus has not gone away. The virus is still there. What we managed to do is to suppress it. Uh, you know, this long, long lockdown period, we managed to suppress it. Uh, now, there are two theories by epidemiologists on this. The first is that uh, one set of epidemiologists feel that we should proceed with a herd immunity theory, which is what Sweden has practiced, and say that over a period of time, everybody should get infected. Now, that's possible in the case of Sweden because the population levels are very, very small. But if India was to do that herd immunity uh, without a lockdown, the level of fatalities and mortality would have been so high that there would have been a huge amount of demortalization of the system of every single individual that people, you know, so it was necessary to do that lockdown and prepare yourself. But as you go down, we must understand that right now you can keep yourself safe as long as you are maintaining physical distancing, that is the only vaccine. Number two, you must wear masks. And number three, you must wash your hands. And number four, please ensure, all of us have to ensure that our senior citizens and elderly people with comorbidity beyond the age of 60 are all at home. I mean, this is a tough job, but these four things are the only vaccines available right now. Uh, there's no other option. And with this, if Indians are able to work in a disciplined manner, then we'll be able to revive our economy. It's not possible to do it without that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. CK, uh, you know, the other, other point I want to make, other point I want to make uh, with reference to what Ashpati asked me was that, and you know, many of you would have this question about an economic package and so on. and. Uh, I think it's important to understand that the government has done one welfare package. It, Reserve Bank has done two and a half packages. Uh, the government, the answer doesn't lie in a, a monetary response. It lies in a fiscal response. The government will definitely come up with a fiscal response. We'll have to wait for the finance minister to do that. But, you know, any kind of a fiscal response you do uh, will is, is a function of some very sustained economic 
uh, you know, structural reforms in the economy which we must carry out. If we are not able to carry out structural reforms and make India a very efficient economy in the long run uh, by improving our processes, by improving our, uh, you know, doing away with antiquated laws, etc., or making ourselves more efficient, it'll be very, you can have any number of packages, economic packages, India will not become an efficient nation. And therefore, this is an opportunity for major structural reforms in India. Thank you. Uh, the next one is uh, Mr. C.K. Ranganathan. Thanks, Sanjay. Good evening. Uh, my question is you have answered, but still I wanted to ask you this. Uh, the, for the COVID-19 to come down substantially, I think the society need to behave itself. Any amount of governance, police cannot stand everywhere and control the kind of thing. The moment you let them, the, some relaxation happens. Everybody comes like a herd and no social distancing is maintained. Unless that comes into the society, I think we will continue to fight this for a long, long time. And the cases will only surge. So therefore, I think there should be enough communications in terms of advertisement, both in social media and also in the TV through the kind of thing to create enough kind of self-awareness and society controlling the whole thing than policemen controlling. Yeah. I, I feel that kind of efforts is missing is my viewpoint. Other, other observation is also the one is the school education with the social distancing is there and the school children are far more vulnerable. I think given the way the uh, pandemic is uh, evolving, it will take at least another six months or till such time the vaccine comes in. Dreaming of a school education at the school place is not going to be easy, is my viewpoint. Therefore, online education is one of the major uh, this thing, Brahmastra, we should use it. And we, through that also, we can reach Nook and Karnat of the village. And this is also this thing, provided the connectivity is there. I think largely the rural everywhere is connected there. So I'd like to have your comments, sir. No, I think it's a very important point. You see, uh, uh, my belief is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, having done the God's Own Country and Incredible India campaigns, you know, uh, my belief is that, uh, uh, you know, you can market and promote anything through advertisement, but the product has to be good. You know, so if, if the, you can do any advertising, but if the Indian mindset is that I'm going to go and buy liquor, uh, no, ad, no amount of advertising will change the sick mindset. People will still go line up and get infected, but they will go and buy liquor. So I think you, we need to mobilize community leaders. We need to mobilize, uh, you know, uh, why am I speaking to you? I'm speaking to you and spending so much time because you people are business leaders and you should spread this message. And each one of us, community leaders, I've mobilized 92,000 non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations which were feeding, uh, feeding uh, migrant laborers throughout this period. So that there's a change of mindset amongst the people. And that is our objective, that we are able to change the mindset of Indians. And that is very, very critical. But the point, the second point you made about using this as an opportunity, you know, it'll take us a decade, 15 years, 20 years to do online education. But this is a massive opportunity, actually. This crisis is a huge opportunity. And this crisis is, if we can seize this opportunity, we can probably make our education totally online within the next six months period. That is our objective. If we can do uh, Arogya Setu and if we could do tele telemedicine guidelines, telemedicine guidelines were pending for a decade, one decade. We were able to clinch it from Niti Aayog in seven days time. And we've launched an app for it on the, on the Arogya Setu. It's called the Arogya Setu Mitra. All in about 10 days time. So if we are able to, in six months time, make our education online across India, this will be the biggest quantum jump we'll make. And that is why we've identified seven areas where we'll use technology to make a big jump. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, now we'll take questions from the audience. And like I said, there's plenty of them. Sanjay, two, 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 two questions. questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the first one is from Ajayan Kabungal uh, Anath. He's uh, from Calicut. He says, we need to focus on the unorganized sector. And this sector is going to be the worst affected. There will be challenges in making the lockdown effective for a longer period. What is the clear action plan for them? Because they're very important to bring our economy back. Yeah. 
No, I think it's a very important question and I'm glad it's from Calicut because I was district collector in Calicut many years back and I have very fond memories. So it's a very important question that the unorganized sector is very, you know, when we talk about MSME, we don't forget to realize that actually 90% of it is micro and they all operate with just four to five to six people, less than nine people. And therefore, this is a sector where we need to put a lot of, lot of our thinking cap and uh, you know, it's become organized, it's become un unorganized because, uh, you know, the organized sector, we have very high rates of IP EPFO, ESIC, all this, the labor rules regulation. So how do we make our organized sector more uh, flexible and, you know, have less constraints on them so that the unorganized also becomes organized in a dignified manner. That is the real challenge for India. And I think that is some of the work which we have done in Niti. Uh, we are trying to push it very hard. If that happens, then more and more people will get, but we are, uh, we are definitely very concerned about uh, the informal worker. We are definitely very concerned about uh, the unorganized work worker and how to take care of them. And much of that, uh, is something which we we are trying to figure out for the next next uh, bit of announcements. Okay, uh, one more question from Krishan Kalra. He says, despite all that Indian companies might do for achieving global quality and global scale, our cost vis-a-vis -vis China will remain a factor against us unless we tackle our prohibitive costs of logistics and remove the costly sloth in our import and export procedures. We may not be able to compete with China. And this is going to be a huge factor. The world will soon forget the sentiments they have today against China as soon as they start offering lower prices. Any comments on this? Yeah, I think it's an important point. It's uh, uh, the import-export regulations are complex. We need to make them very, very simple, very, very easy. Uh, we've done a lot of work around this. I've taken it up with the revenue secretary so that many of these things are scrapped and made simple. Uh, and actually, uh, the customs and excise department becomes very easy, uh, simple, uh, far more digital, totally digital. Uh, that is what we are trying to do. Uh, we are trying to see in some of these areas, what is the difference we can make. Okay. Just one more question, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, this is from Sumit Agarwal. He says, for Make in India, banks need to be very supportive as they do not follow the schemes that, are, that have been announced by government. Under MSME scheme, collateral free loans should be given, but banks do not cooperate. How does one deal with this problem? I know it may be outside your scope, but... No, well, you know, it's uh, it's something which I've been constantly talking to uh, the uh, government. It's talking to the finance ministry, talking to the Reserve Bank of India. The challenge has been that, uh, uh, you know, we have to get the animal spirit of India back. And, you know, the animal spirit of India has to come back not merely in businesses, it has to come back in governments by taking risky decisions, and it has to come back in bankers by lending money, uh, by uh, putting money in reverse repo. Uh, that was what was happening. And therefore, the RBI has slashed the reverse repo down to 3.3%. 3.5% 3, 3, 3 or 3.75%. Uh, now, hopefully, the banks will start lending. And uh, if they do not lend, I think in the initial period, government should provide some kind of a credit guarantee so that we get the momentum going for lending from banks. And this is critical. And uh, we are looking at all these options. So it's, I, I, I think some of these options are being explored. Okay. Uh, I know that uh, you are uh, pressed for time. So we will end this program. A uh, huge thank you to you from IMA for, as usual, an outstanding and enthusiastic address. Uh, you stayed well beyond the time you requested and answered every single question, actually. And uh, you answered them so well, uh, all the questions that we came up with. I am, and I'm sure the rest of us on this call are encouraged and happy to note that our old policies are being looked at. And in future, you will be... Uh, you know, encouraging Indian startups and manufacturers and not only encouraging them, but also promoting them. Uh, but that means, of course, that uh, there are more responsibilities on us to be far more efficient uh, and as well as being far more ethical. Because if you are going to promote Indian companies, then we need to be very clear that whatever we give you is value for money. 
So uh, with that, I think uh, I'd like to say we look forward for the opening up uh, as soon as it comes and uh, a much brighter future for all of us in India. Thank you so much. Amit. Thank you. Has your, has your company opened up in Pune? Uh, yes, uh, our plant is in rural India and we have our own township. So not only have we opened up, we've started our exports. We've sent quite a few containers. All our domestic customers we followed up with and asked uh, who all uh, need goods. And we've started shipments and we've also started manufacturing in the uh, It's in Sangli district, in rural Sangli district. So congratulations and I think everybody else must emulate you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, with that, I think, uh, Rekha, will you take over or shall I close the session? Please close the session. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for being with us. And as Rekha said, the next session is tomorrow with uh, Dr. Anil Sahasrabudde, who is the chairman of AICTE. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. Same time, 6.30 to 7.00. Six, uh, I think it's 6 o'clock. 6, six o'clock. Yeah. My mistake. Sorry. 6 o'clock. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.